so much for joining us for Bible study on tonight. Our scripture will come from Romans 12 and 12. And it says, Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. Romans 12 and 12 again says, Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. Our song is One More Day, One More Day. I thank God just for one more day. One more day the Lord has made a way. I thank God just for one more day. One more chance, one more chance. I thank God just for one more chance. One more chance to do the best I can. I thank God just for one more chance. One more day. us and you've kept us. God, you've wrapped your arms around us and you've allowed us to be who we are. Now, Lord, you've kept us in our right mind and we're glad about it. And Lord, we're grateful and we're thankful for you. Lord, we thank you that you love us in spite of us. Lord, we ask you, Father God, to bless us as we dig into your word. That your word will fall on good soil. That your word will make a difference in our lives. That your word will go forth, Father God, and that we will tell men, women, boys, and girls about the goodness of God's word. 
It's in the powerful, precious name of Jesus the Christ we pray. And we ask it all. Amen and thank God. Yes, Lord. Bless us again, and we are thankful for it, and we are glad about it. Amen. Are you glad about it, and you thankful for it? God has blessed us another day. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Amen. Last week, when we left off, we were talking about God's love toward mankind, and how we're looking to to develop a loving relationship with God, as God is looking and pursuing a loving relationship with us yes so we want to develop a love relationship with him as he is willing to develop a love relationship with us amen two four maybe you all can share that handout amen we're looking forward to what god is doing in our lives and we're looking forward to loving god as god loves us we want to love god as God loves loves us. Amen. So we, we left off last week with uh, the ending of the first day in unit three in our uh, Experience in God book. And we're going to look at just a little bit of day two, just a tad bit of day two um, on page number 55 is where we are. We'll look at just a little bit of day two. And then we're gonna let you do the homework assignment that's listed under day two. So we're gonna continue with our questions that we had on last week. Yes, we had questions, homework assignments on last week and everybody's so happy and glad. You can tell when students are ready. They look like they're ready. They're excited about being here. And they're so glad that they got there. How many people are just happy to be here today that God has has blessed you to be here. Anybody? Anybody's way? Uh, the songwriter said, I could have been dead, sleeping in my grave, but God made old death behave. Now, you're probably glad to be here, but you're not probably, probably not glad to have your homework ready. But I'm sure you do. You're great Bible students of the Word of God. Amen. What was one of our questions on last week that we we left here as with homework assignment. What was one of the questions on last week? What was one of our questions on last week? Who's talking? Who's talking? Uh, we had to uh, define the natural man, the carnal man, and the spiritual man. And if you're not saved, can that person love God? If a person is not saved, can they love God? And also, can anyone who's not saved, well, that's the same question, can anyone who's not saved love God? Okay. Can we really experience life without Jesus? Okay. So there's three questions there. Number one, what are the three degrees of man, the natural, the carnal, and the spiritual? Where are they in scripture? What do they mean? That's one question. Uh, number two is, can one really love God who is not born again? So what was the third one, Sister Davis? Can we really experience Can life without Jesus? Really experience life without Jesus. Let's start with the easy ones first. Which one are the easy ones for you? Which one is easy for you? Which one was easy for you? Who's talking? Who's talking? Which one was easy for you? Amen. Who's talking? Who's talking? Which one is easy? Okay, let's start with one of them. All right. We, we talked about in, in the book, the Four Spiritual Laws book, this Four Spiritual Laws book, we talked about how Bill Bright lays out, he lays out man being selfish and man having Jesus on the throne, right? So you have a handout to that effect. Let's talk about that first. The Four Spiritual Laws, uh, in the Four Spiritual Law book, the Fourth Law, is that you must individually receive Jesus Christ as your savior. You gotta experience him for yourself. So Sister, can you change this one with me so those who are listening 
online. You can see it, a bigger picture of it. So, so we, we talk about these two diagrams, these two diagrams right here. One shows our interests and we are in control. The other one shows that Jesus is on the throne. And when Jesus is on the throne, then we see all of our interests laid out in a uniform pattern, yes? And then when you see S, meaning self, when you see self on the throne, you will see that things are all in the uproar. There's chaos, there's misery, there's messed up situations. Now, let me just make sure that we understand, just because you have Jesus on the throne doesn't mean that all your interests are gonna be laid out and, and things are gonna be a walk in the park. That everything gonna be preaching twin king. But when you have Jesus on, this, on the throne, he directs our lives and he makes sure that our lives are in order, yes? So when you have a self-directed life, self is on the throne. A self-directed life shows us, and Bill Bright in the book, Four Spiritual Laws, he says that self is on the throne. Christ is outside of your life. He is outside of your circle of influence. In other words, you're influencing people in the wrong direction and Christ is not influencing you. So whenever self is on the throne, that means self is in control. Self is running things. And when self is running things, self does what self wants to do. Self does what self wants to do any way self want to do it. Anytime self wants to do it, self just does it. Self does what self wants to do. So it's selfishness. It is, uh, I am my own king. I am my own queen. I do what I want to do. Have anybody been there before? Has anybody known anybody that's been there before? Because when you are on the throne, you do whatever you want to do. And we do just enough to mess up our lives. I'm telling you, when we're on the throne, we know how to mess up our lives. We know how to mess up stuff. And when we know how to mess up stuff, we, don't, we not only mess it up a little bit, we mess it up a whole heap in a plenty. When self is on the throne, our interests, our desires, everything is all in an uproar. When you see the cross on the outside of the circle, self is on the inside. The cross is on the outside. Self is on the throne, meaning Jesus is not a part of that person's life. Or Jesus is a part of it and he's not directing it. Self is on the throne. The interests are directed by self, often resulting in discourse and frustration. Self is on the throne. The other part of that picture, you will see that Jesus, represented by the cross, Jesus is on the throne. Whenever Jesus is on the throne, on the throne, things happen. First of all, Christ is in our lives and he's on the throne. Christ is leading, guiding, and protecting us. He is giving us direction. When Christ is on the throne, self is yielding to Christ. We obey Christ. We walk with Christ. We live for Christ. We do the things that Jesus Christ wants us to do. And look at what Christ does. When Christ is on the throne, he includes us in his circle. If you look at the first diagram, we're on the throne, self is on the throne, and we don't include Christ in our circle. But when Christ is on the throne, Christ includes us in his circle. We're talking about loving God. We're talking about being a part of godliness. We're talking about walking with God. When Christ is on the throne, he includes us in the circle. When Christ is on the throne, he blesses us. When Christ is on the throne, he lays things out for us. He watches over us. 
The analogy is, there's a, there was once a blind girl. And every day, the daddy would walk the blind girl to school. He would put her on the bus. And when she got off the bus, a teacher on the end of the bus route would come and usher that child to her classroom. One day, she got to a point where she said, Daddy, I can handle this. I can walk to the bus stop. I can get on the bus. I can go to school. And you don't have to have a teacher meet me on the other side. So this girl walks to school. And as she begins to walk to school, she noticed that she was able to do it. She was able to do it all by herself. So she rushes back home and she said, Daddy, I did it. I went to the bus stop. I got on the bus. I was on the bus by myself. I left the bus and I went to my classroom all by myself. Daddy, you didn't have to support me. Little that the little girl knew that because she was blind, Daddy was walking with her all the time. He was watching over her. He was making sure that cars stopped. He was making sure that she got on the bus without tripping. And even though the teacher wasn't on the other end, the daddy made sure that she made her way to the class and she never knew that daddy was watching. That's what God does for us. Even when we get to be mature Christians, we need him to lead us, guide us, and direct us. He's watching over us. Have you ever come to a conclusion that, that you can handle it on your own? You don't really need God right now? Come on, y'all. Y'all just acting holy tonight. Y'all just acting like you're holy tonight. So, we have to get to a point in our lives where we Oftentimes, matter of fact, every time we give God the opportunity to lead God and direct us. He wants to love us. He wants to chase after us. He wants to show his love for us. He loves us so much until he wants a love relationship with us. God loves you. But the problem is, as seen in the first diagram, the problem is that we are on the throne and we are running things. God, I got this. God, I got this. And we can handle it by ourselves. We can run it by ourselves. You know, when we come to the point where we think we can run it ourselves, we do things that are ungodly. We carry ourselves like we're not Christians. We are quick to go off. The senior saint said, files at the handle. We're quick to fly off the handle. So, but when God is walking with us and we allow him to lead us, he makes sure that we don't step in potholes. He, we don't know where the ditches that people have dug for us. But God knows. We don't know how people are going to approach us. But God knows. We don't know the dangers unseen. But God knows every danger we can run into. And he watches over us. This little blind girl, she didn't know the dangers because daddy held her hand every morning for the first semester. But... Even when she had gotten to a point where she thought, thought she could do it, mm -hmm. Daddy held the cars back. Mm -hmm. Daddy made sure her steps were in the right place. Mm -hmm. Daddy, she thought somebody was bumping her into the crowd, but what it was, Daddy was nudging her around the potholes. Mm -hmm. And that's what God does. He loves us so much until he doesn't scream. Many times it's a small, quiet, tender voice. Don't do this. Don't go that way. There's a hole in the road. 
don't do it. Because he's God who loves us. And he wants a loving relationship with us. Let me get a volunteer to read the first two or three paragraphs. If you can, three volunteers to read the first three paragraphs for us on page 55 in the Experience in God book. Three volunteers. It's better to volunteer than to be voluntold. Isn't that right? Hallelujah. You read that first, those first three, one person read each paragraph for me. Picture in mind a tall ladder leaning against the wall. Now think about your life as a process of climbing the ladder. Wouldn't it be tragic, tragedy to ascend to the top and find that you placed the ladder against the wrong wall? One life to live and you missed it. Earlier in the course, we talked about life being God-centered. This means your life must be properly related to God. This is the love relationship for which you were created. A God-centered love relationship. Your walk with God, Father, Son, and Spirit is the single most important aspect of your life. If it is not, it should be nothing else will if it's not, as it should be, nothing else will function properly. Look at what the author says. He says we ought to desire a God-centered life. We ought to want a God-centered life. And with a God-centered life, we want to make sure we relate to God properly. We want God to love on us and we ought to love. We ought to make sure that we have a God-centered life. He gives the analogy, what if you have a ladder that's stationed on the side of a wall and you climb that ladder and you get to the top and realize that your ladder was on the wrong wall. Good God Almighty. And this ladder represents your entire life. Your entire life is based on this ladder. And some of us climb ladders faster than others. I used to climb faster than a week ago. I used to climb a little faster. I don't climb as fast as I used to. But the race is not given to the swift. Nor is the battle given to the strong. But it's given to who he who finishes. And in this case, who finishes with the right life. A fruitful life. God wants us to have a God-centered life. He wants us to walk with him. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. This is the love relationship for which we were created. A God-centered love relationship. A relationship where God gets to spend time with us. Anytime he wants to. How many of you, God has set an appointment to get with you? Anybody? God, God has to set an appointment. Jimmy Campbell, Jimmy Campbell made a joke with Oprah. You know, Jimmy Campbell plays, plays the same old things every, every three weeks. He, he do the same old same old interviews, he, he, it's, re, it's replays, it's replays over and over again. So Jimmy Kimmel had Oprah Winfrey, Oprah Winfrey on his show, and he made a joke out of it, but Christians didn't think it was very funny. Brother Miles, he asked Oprah, Oprah, does God have to call you to get your permission? What he was doing is saying, Oprah is the queen. Oprah is the one who makes the universe run. And they laughed about it. Oprah, does God have to, does God have to call you? Does God have to call you to get an appointment with you? My question tonight is, does God have to call you? Does God have to call you? Does God have to chase you to get an appointment with you? Is your ladder standing against the right wall? Or does God have to come looking for you? 
Boy, y'all see how y'all quiet y'all are. You all want to hear how sour y'all are. You all want to hear it. You, you ought to see how you're looking at me. The question is, does God have to get in touch with you to get your permission? And I dare say, God does have to get some people permission, but it's not to their best interest that God has to get their permission. And we're going to talk about the carnal man here late, later, who's reading the second paragraph for us. The second paragraph. Who's reading? I have known business people who lost their business, their money, and their property. With everything stripped away, they had to decide if having Jesus was enough for them to still have joy. If you lost all of your money and possessions, but you had a vibrant walk with God, could you truly be happy? We are a doing people. We feel worthless or useless if we are not busy doing something. Scripture leads us to understand that God is saying, I want you to love me above everything else. When you are in a relationship of love with me, you have everything you need. To be loved by God is the highest relationship, the greatest achievement, and the noblest position in life. <laughs> to be loved by God. To be loved by God. It is the highest love one will ever experience. To be loved by God. It is the highest relationship. It is the greatest achievement. And it is the noblest position in life. To be loved by God. Some people believe that being the president of the great United States of America makes them the most powerful male or female on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. Who would want a job like that? <laughs> Some people have concluded that the president of the United States is the greatest thing that you could possibly ever be. Our author tells us tonight, the greatest position to ever be in is to be loved by God and to have a love relationship with him. That's the greatest place to be. I mean, that's, that's, that's the greatest. And then he goes on to talk about if you lose your money, if you lose your possessions, will you still have joy? If you lose your business, if you lose your property, will you still have joy? Joy. If you lose, lose a loved one, will you still have joy? We didn't say happy. We, we you know, we get we get happiness and, and joy mixed up. He didn't ask the question, will you be happy? The question is, will you have joy? There's a difference between happiness and joy. Joy is something that only God can give. The world can't take it away. Circumstances can't remove it. We're going to have joy regardless. Somebody said the other day, it doesn't matter which way the economy go, I've learned to live in an economy worse than this one. I'm going to still have joy. I've learned to eat beans. I've learned to eat cornbread and, and buttermilk. I learned to eat cereal with water. Regardless of what happens, I'm gonna still have joy. I learned to do without what I want. I still have joy. Don't let the devil steal your joy. The John, John 10, 10 says the devil comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. He comes to kill your spirit. He come to, to kill off your joy. He want to steal it and take it away. Don't let the devil have your joy. Songwriter said, this joy I have, 
The world didn't give it to me, and the world will not take it away. This joy I have. This joy I have is like none other. God alone gives me joy. If you lost all your money, got lost all your possessions, and I go a little further, if you don't get what you want, can you still have joy? Can God still rule over your life? Who has the third paragraph? That does not mean that you will never accomplish anything as an expression of your love for God. He will call you to obey him and to do whatever he asks of you. However, you do not need to do something to feel fulfilled. You are completely fulfilled in a relationship with God. When you are filled with him, what else do you need? I got Jesus, thank you. I got Jesus and that's enough. How I many really believe that? Do you really believe that? I got Jesus. I don't have my job, but I got Jesus. I don't have a spouse, but I got Jesus. I don't have children, but I got Jesus. Do we really, really believe that? I don't have education, but I got Jesus. And Jesus alone is enough. Because the fact of the matter is, Jesus can give you whatever he needs you to have. If we got Jesus. If we have all these things and don't have Jesus, we don't have enough. But if we got none of these things and have Jesus, we have enough. God is. God's enough. I want you to finish these next three pages for me. Finish those next three, four, next four pages of assignments for me. One through, all the way through eight. One through eight, we'll end up on page 58. And so finish those assignments for me as we continue to talk about the fact that when we got Jesus, we got enough. And number one, you will find out that he talks about silver and gold. He talks about riches unfold, untold. He talks about houses and land. He talked about if I have none of these things, I can rely on the fact that I have Jesus' nail-pierced hands. Jesus' death on the cross. If we didn't have that, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have God, we wouldn't have heaven, and then we would live a miserable life in a miserable death. That brings us to our assignment of the, the three different degrees of a man. Three different degrees. We talked about three degrees of a man. What are those three degrees are? You may call it something else. I'm, I'm calling it degrees. Natural man. Natural man, carnal man, carnal man, carnal man and, spiritual man. and spiritual man. Okay, who's who's gonna take natural man for us? Pass them the mic. They're gonna take the natural man, then the carnal man, and the spiritual man. The natural man. Who is the natural man? Who is the carnal man? And who is the spiritual man? The natural man. Now, tell me who he is. Somebody tell me. Who is the natural man? Okay, brother, you got that. natural man is uh, the man as he is born. As he is born. In, in his sinful state. In a sinful state. So the natural man is a freshly born man. He can be 50, 60, 80 years old. But if he, there's something missing. What if? What is that missing? Brother Miles, he's natural. He's as he was born in his sinful state. What's missing or who's missing in his life? There is no Jesus in the natural man's life. He's not saved. There is no Jesus there. He has never received salvation. He's not born again. He's a natural man. He's not saved. He's not spiritual. He doesn't have spiritual understanding. That's why people who are not saved, who are natural, who say, there is no use in you going out there to that church and listen to a man that's just like you are. They're natural. Their mind is natural. Their hearts are natural. They are just like they were when they showed up. They are unspiritual, ungodly. They don't know God. They just, they tell you in a heartbeat, we all are children of God. But we're not all saints of God. 
The natural rain. Any any questions or comments about the natural rain? Give me an example of a natural rain. Brother Miles say just like you before. Are you talking about physical attributes or what kind of he's just like he's born? What's what are some of the attributes we're talking about? He doesn't have a, a relationship with Christ. Anybody else? Because he can't have a relationship with Christ if he's not saved. Jesus said, I'm getting into the rest of the lesson, but Jesus says to Nicodemus in John 3 and 3, except you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You can't even imagine it. You can't identify with it. You don't understand it. You must be born again. And this is how the master man talked, just like Nicodemus was talking. Nicodemus says, are you talking about being born again, going back into my mother's womb and being, being thrust out again? Jesus said, no, that which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of water is water. I'm not talking about that which is born of water, not that which is born of flesh. I'm talking about that which is born of the spirit. Have you ever wondered what you're talking about being born of water? Some of these ladies getting ready to tell me what that means. Being born of the water. Being born. How can you tell when a woman, other than the crowning of the head, how can you tell when a woman baby is ready to come out? Other than the crowning of the head. Our water broke. The water broke. Now everybody ought to know about that one. <laughs> the water broke. Is there a physical breaking of the water? Yes. Yes, it is. Why y'all say the water broke? Come on, talk to me. Is there a physical breaking of the water? Yes. yes. What happened? That, that, that sack that the baby's been for, for all in months, years, oh, I mean months. Oh, okay. Teach so the baby is is in water and never drowns. Isn't that amazing? Look at God. This baby for nine months, average, nine months, this baby for nine months has never been taught to swim. But he's doing aerobics in the water. <laughs> Kicking and carrying on. Punching and pushing and and all of a sudden, water breaks. If the demons want to know, do I have to go back into my mother's womb and be born again? To us, it doesn't make sense, right? But Nick the demon was so serious. He was an educated man. He was a man of the word. But he asked the question, how do I get born again? Because he understood that when you're born one time, in order to be born again, you've got to be born over. Jesus says, I'm not talking about breaking the water. I'm not talking about the natural. I'm not talking about the physical. I'm talking about you must spiritually be born again. All of us are born one time. But many of us are born again. Why do we have to be born again? Well, Adam and Eve sinned. That separated us from God. And when we're separated from God, God can't get to us. We can't get to God. And because we're separated from God, that's why Bill Bright wrote this little book, The Four Spiritual Laws. First of all, man is sinful and separated from God. Therefore, he cannot know and experience God's love and plan for his life. Man is sinful. Man is separated from God. He cannot experience, this is the natural man, he cannot experience, nor can he know God's love and plan for his life. That's the answer. He cannot know God's love and plan for his life. Man is separated. He's separated by sin. First law says God loves us and also a wonderful plan for his life. The second law says that man is sinful and separated from God. The, the third law says Jesus is God's provision. Jesus bridges the gap between man and God. In our sinful moments, we need a, a person 
to a lawyer to plead our case. That's why we have to confess because our lawyer has to plead our case. And you never want to go to court and don't tell your lawyer the whole story. You don't ever want to go to court and your lawyer get in court and there's a surprise. And he looks at you or she looks at you and said, well, why didn't I know that? The prosecutor brings allegations before you and they are true and your lawyer doesn't know about it, he cannot defend you. The third law is Jesus is God's provision. He pleads our case. He's our advocate. He is the one who pleads our case for us. He's our lawyer. Everybody in here needs a lawyer. His name is Jesus. You may not ever go to court. You may not, you may not ever go to jail. But you need Jesus to stay out of hell. I guarantee you. My brother-in-law used to work for Harris County and uh, and a uh, guy found out that he was a preacher when they come in, you know, he had he was the one that had to interview the guys and determine whether they get probation and all that. And the guy would find out that he's a preacher, so what they would do when they found out he was a preacher, they said, uh, uh, I, I, I got saved. He said, oh yeah, you got saved so you won't go to hell. But you going to jail. Are you with me? So we need a lawyer to keep us from going to hell. His name is Jesus. He bridged the gap. And as you look at the four spiritual laws, you will see he is bridging the gap between God and man. That's the third law. The fourth law is that we must individually receive Jesus as our personal savior. We have to receive Jesus Christ and believe on his death, burial, and resurrection for ourselves. Too many people trying to go by what granddaddy did. My granddaddy was the chairman of deacons. You got to receive it for yourself. Back home, they said like this, every tub must sit on his own bottom. Meaning you have to individually receive him Receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord. What's the difference between Lord and Savior or Savior and Lord? Is there a difference? Same person, Jesus, yes? So the same person is Jesus, but where is their difference? What is the difference between Savior and Lord? It's the same person. Is there a difference? Who has the microphone? Who's talking? Pass it right there to your, to your left, Brother Miles. Pass it on to your left, sister. All right. So, what is the difference between Jesus being our Lord and Jesus being our Savior? He's our Savior because he died for our sins. But the switch on? Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh. Now, okay. he's our Savior because he died for our sins, but he has. we have to choose to make him our Lord. Okay. That he's going to lead God, just like a picture. Okay. That we're going to submit to him and let him lead us. So when we submit to Jesus, after we are saved, I never, that would have been my next question, which comes first. So after we are saved, he can become our Lord. He is our Savior upon our giving our lives to him. But then he becomes our Lord as we yield to him. We are led by him. We obey him. We're still talking about this natural man and how he gets saved. Now, once he gets saved, Sister David says, we got to have him as our savior, meaning we have to believe the story and really trust the story to get us from earth to glory. The story is Jesus died, Jesus buried, Jesus rose, and Jesus was seen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 5. Jesus died, Jesus was buried, Jesus rose, and Jesus was seen. Jesus was seen as evidence that he got up. And once we are saved, we have to commit our ways to him in order for him to be our Lord. So that takes us to the second man. The second man is who? The carnal man. 
The carnal man. Who wants to tell us who the carnal man is? We've already talked about the natural man. The natural man is one is one who is not saved. We're talking about the carnal man. Pass the mic to somebody. The carnal man. The carnal man. You know how you stand in the circle and you throw him the ball? Throw the, throw the mic. So the carnal man. The carnal man. Who is the carnal man? Just pass it behind you. Somebody's reaching for it. The carnal man. So I'm, I'm assuming that the carnal man is the one who uh, actively seeks after the things of the flesh. So searching okay. to searching searching to do wrong, searching for wrong. Okay. Wanting to do wrong. Okay. Uh, sort of a, a form of, of a form of rejection of the spiritual things. Okay. But there's something about this carnal man that's different from the natural man. What is the difference in the natural man and the carnal man? Yes, the word carnal suggests that he is fleshly, he is worldly, but there's something different about the carnal man. There's something different in the carnal man and the natural man. What is the difference? He knows better. He knows better. He knows better, yeah, he does. So how does he know better though? He's saved. He's a believer, so the carnal man is a saved man that, as she say, knows better, but he's still fleshly, he's still worldly, he still seeks his own desires. He is a carnal man or woman. He's a carnal man. He is a man that is born again, and, and he doesn't, so, so Henry said, he doesn't act like he's saved. He's just a choker. Many times, when we grow up in church, we can act saved. But the carnal man, he doesn't even act like he's saved. That joker is just a joker. He's saved. He's on his way to heaven. Jesus is his savior, but Jesus is not his Lord. That's the key. He came to Jesus. Now he knows all the right terms. He knows what to say. He knows how to act, but then he does his own thing whenever he wants to do it. He's a carnal man. It's a bad thing to be a carnal man or woman. Being saved, knowing better. So to say he knows better. I hadn't thought about that. He knows better because he's saved. He knows better. It's a thing, it's a bad thing to know better than I do better. You know, when we come to, to Bible study, we learn things that we can't talk back to each other on Sunday morning. Because if I opened up a dialogue on Sunday morning, we got out at 1 o'clock, then both folks start talking about that. <laughs> 1 o'clock, we've been sitting here. Now, they can party for four hours, but they can't listen to the word for an hour and a half. A carnal man, a carnal man is more in tune with fun than he is in tune with spiritual things. It's 12 o'clock. <laughs> CJ, stop getting ready to throw that ball, Rip. When you gonna get out of here? <laughs> carnal man. Rip, we gotta get out of here, Rip. You, you, you talking about some word, man. Give us the word and get out of here. The reason why I like to go to the little church is they in and out in an hour. Cannot give God an hour and a half out of 168 hours in a day, in a week. 168 hours in a week. And we can't give God an hour and a half a week. That's because we are carnal. We're worldly. We're fleshly. We can't stand too much preaching. And we show can't stand too much word. We rather talk about tradition than we talk about the word. It's amazing me. I, I, I've been on very a whole lot of uh, catechisms and a whole lot of uh, um, dedications and a, a whole lot of deacon. Um, what do you call it when you ordination councils? And one deacon said, Reverend, 
I'm going to tell you, man, it says it in the Bible, but I just can't go back there. I've been taught the other way. I said, now, D. <laughs> he said, now, it's hard to go with this thing that's in this Bible when I've been, been taught this for many years, Reverend. I said, D, we in trouble. You already a deacon, and we in trouble. Because we have some deacons already who are already deacons sitting in on the ordination council. Come on. It says it in the word. Do you understand the word? Yes. Do you do you agree with what I'm saying? The word saying yes. But I ain't never been taught this before. But when you learn better, you do better. If you no longer want to be a carnal man. When you look at Ephesians chapter two, verse one, someone get that one for me, and someone get First Corinthians chapter two, verses fourteen through sixteen. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 and 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14 and 16. How out if you got it? Ephesians chapter one, chapter 2 verse 1. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14 through 16. We're gonna move to the spiritual man. Who's reading? Who's reading Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1? Stan, read that for me real quick. Real big, please. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you have been quickened who are dead in trespasses and sins. Okay, you've been quickened. You've been changed. He's reminding the carnal man. Thank you. He's reminding the carnal man. You've been changed. You ought to act like you changed. You are different now. Folk ought to see that you're different. You are a carnal man if you're still worldly. You gotta act like you've been quickened, you've been changed. And this word quicken means the same word that God uses when it talks about Jesus being raised from the dead. Jesus was quicken. The Greek word is roused. God roused Jesus from the dead. You have been roused from the dead. Ephesians goes on to talk about, in Ephesians chapter two, he goes on to talk about that we were dead in our trespasses, but God has made us alive. God has made us alive. We've been quickened. We have been quickened. First Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, Sister Carolyn Davis. First Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. First Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. Verse 16, for who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Look at what he says. The spiritual man has the mind of Christ. The spiritual man walks after Jesus Christ. The spiritual man is submissive to Jesus Christ. And he compares the natural man to the spiritual man, and the natural man doesn't even know what's going on. They talk about stuff like, why are you going to church? They talk about stuff like, you ain't perfect. Have you ever had anybody tell you, you're not perfect? They can either be natural or, or carnal. You ain't perfect, you ain't all that. There are struggles that take place even in the spiritual man. Paul says in Romans chapter 7, beginning in verse 14, all the way to verse 25, he says, the, wood, the good that I would, I do not. And that which I would not is what I do. And I find myself with members fighting against my spiritual man. And every time I would to do good, evil is present with me. He gets to verse number 24, he says, oh, wretched man that I am, oh, beaten down man, oh, burdened man, Oh, wretched man that I am, I'm about to give up. Who's going to deliver me from this sinful death? Verse 24. Then verse 25 comes and Paul comes to himself and he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ. He will deliver me from this sinful death. And he moves to verse 25 of Romans chapter 7 and moves into Romans chapter 8 verse 1. He said, now there is now therefore no condemnation. For those who walk in the spirit and not after the flesh. Yes. There is now no condemnation. 
The Bible says that the laws weren't made for those who were law-abiding citizens. The laws were made for those who were unlawful and who are unlawful. You ever been riding with a person and all of a sudden they slam on brakes? They slam on brakes because they see a black and white up there. They can be driving the speed limit. The speed limit can be 65 and they're driving 55. But when they see a police officer, about to break your neck. Because they are guilty. The guilty will always try to run. Proverbs says, I think it's Proverbs 28, 1 says that the guilty is the, the guilty is always running when no one's chasing them. A lot of police officers say, why did you run? I just saw a cop, man. I just started running. We're not even asking you, but I saw a cop. I just, the guilty is always running, and they run when no one's chasing them. So you want to be a spiritual man or woman. You want to be a spiritual man that is, is listening to God, following God, obeying God, and then you have a love relationship with him. But the only way to have that love relationship with him is to trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 5 says that Jesus died for your sins. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. He rose early that third day morning. He was seen by Cephas, meaning Peter. He was seen by the twelve. And then he was seen by over 500 men at one time. The Bible says in Romans 10 and verse 9, that if you believe this story, you shall be saved. John chapter 3 verse 16 says, God loved us, that he gave his son for us, that he died and he rose from the dead. The Bible says that if you are a sinner, if you sin, first, first John chapter 1 verse 9 says, if you sin, and this word if in the Greek means when you sin, because we all sin, uh, when you sin, you have an advocate in Jesus Christ that if you confess your sin, God is faithful and God is just to forgive you your sin and forgive you from all and to cleanse you, forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You ought to try Jesus. He is the Lamb of God. He wants to be your Savior. And he wants to be your Lord. This is your moment. This is your opportunity. If you've never received Jesus as your personal Savior, this is your opportunity to get to know him. This is your chance to have a love relationship with Jesus. All you have to do is bow your head and repeat this simple prayer that you believe that Jesus died for your sins. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. And he rose from the dead. Just repeat after me and say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We believe that you honestly prayed this prayer, believing that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died for your sins. You are now saved. You're on your way to heaven. We believe that God has blessed you, and he's welcoming you to heaven. In the meantime, while you're on planet Earth, you need to spend quality time in the Word. You need to join a good Bible-teaching church. I recommend that you begin in church, where Jesus is the center of attention and the main attraction. But Jesus is the captain who leads us and guides us. He is our Savior, and He is our Lord. Thank you folks so much for joining us for Bible study. Please join us on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for Sunday school. Join us Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. for worship service. And please continue to join us on Wednesday night for Bible study at 7.15 p.m. We're glad you've come. It is now offering time. It's time to give to the Lord. 
through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. If uh, Brother Miles or Brother Whitlock was here, they would say, It is offering time. It is offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. If you want to give electronically, you can do so by giving to our Zelle account. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. That is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. If you want to mail in your gift, you can mail it to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. Are there any praise reports or prayer requests? Praise reports or prayer requests. Have a praise report. We're always uh, urging each other to share Christ. And if you haven't shared Christ this year, if Jesus hadn't come out your mouth this year, it's time for you to play catch up. I was on my way into the post office and a young man was sitting there and he was sitting in a seat where they sit for passports. And um, I made contact with him, eye contact with him, he made eye contact with me. Because I make I make it a habit of whenever I see a person that looked like they may be homeless or somebody that looked like they're gonna ask for something, I wanna make eye contact with them. Even if I don't give them anything, I wanna let them know that you are human. I want to let them know that you're special to God. So the least I could do is make eye contact and speak and say hello. As I passed him up, went to the post office, came back, he was sitting in that same seat. And because I'm the guy who looked him in the eye, I'm the guy who spoke to him, he figured he could approach me. And as I realized by the time I turned the corner, he's not here for a passport. He's just sitting in the chair for the passport. I said, hey man, can you give me a penny? I thought just like you thinking. A penny? Well, I understand real well. If you ask for a penny, people don't carry pennies. So the other man is going to give them more than a penny. I had just reached on the countertop at home and, and pulled a $5 bill off the countertop and put it in my wallet and I was like, okay man, what you gonna do with a penny? He said, I'll get a drink or something, a, a, a Coke or something, a Coke or something. So okay, yeah, okay, so I pulled this $5 out and I gave it to him. But that $5 came with conditions. As we walked out the store together, walked out the post office together with her, I said, man, so what, why are you here? He looks like a healthy young man, looked like he could get a job. So why are you here? He said, well, my brother dropped me off over here. I'm from the other side of town. Well, no, but why are you in the position you're in? He said, yeah, I just, I just got out of jail and I'm homeless. I said, well, have you ever met Jesus? No. I said, so in jail, you never heard about Jesus? <laughs> said no. I said, you were never given the opportunity to, to, to receive Jesus Christ in jail? He said no. I didn't know what he was going to do with the five dollars, but it was worth the conversation. I said, well, would you like to know Jesus as your Savior? Yes, I would. Would you like to receive him right now? Yes, I would. I mean, it's the easiest witness I ever had in my life. I mean, no confrontation, no opposition, but I guess the five dollars made a difference. <laughs> he says, yes, I will. I said, would you like to go to heaven? Yes, I will. Will you bow your head with me and join me in this prayer? I led him to Christ, standing right there on the, on the sidewalk in front of the post office. And he said, well, you know, there's a dollar store around here. I'm going to get me a, a Coke or something. And I said to myself, between here and the dollar store, there's a liquor store also. And it's about three stores before you get to the dollar store. But if you can confess Christ today, it's worth the five dollars. So my praise report is that I led him to Christ.
standing right there at the post office. Just because I mentioned Jesus, his death, burial, and his resurrection. So we want to lift him before the Lord. I'll be putting his name on the prayer list. I don't want to put his name out there right now. But I want to put him on the prayer list and, and touch his heart. And ask God to, to massage his heart for him. That he will give God the glory. Amen. Amen. Our prayer request, we're praying for Sister Lydia and Darrington. Anybody else? We're praying for Sister Lydia and Darrington, who's scheduled for surgery. Anybody else? Who else are we praying? Yes, ma'am. Praying for Sister Nicole Davis. Davis. We're praying for Sister Nicole Davis. Yes, ma'am. For the Ashbury uh, family in Florida. The Ashbury, Ashbury family. The Ashbury family. And we're praying for the residents of Florida. I have... Uh, two cousins and their families in Florida. I talked to them. They they think they're they're out of danger, but they decided to stay. So we're gonna pray and lift them before the Lord. So we're praying for the Ashbury family. We're praying for uh, Sister Nicole Davis. We're praying for um, the, the Floridians. We're praying for Sister Lydia Darrington. Amen. Why don't we stand to be dismissed? Eternal God in heaven, in the name of Jesus the Christ, we come, Lord. We thank you for this privilege of prayer. We ask you to bless us as we go forth. Lord, we ask you to calm the storm. That Florida would not be any further devastated. That the United States of America and the surrounding countries would not be further devastated. We ask you to cease the, the storms, cease the tornadoes, the, cease the tropical storms in the name of Jesus. We ask you, God, because we know you are able and we know you will. We ask you to banish of every wounded heart, heal every burdened person, relieve them of our, their heartaches and their physical scars. We pray for the bereaved even right now. Yes, we ask you, Father God, to bless the, the Ashbury family. We ask you, Father, to touch and heal, and strengthen and deliver. We pray for Sister Lydia Darrington. We ask you, Father God, to encourage her. We pray, Father God, that you fix her ailment. We pray for Sister Nicole Davis. We ask you, Father God, to bless her life. Bless her, give her the heart's desires. We ask you, Father God, to bless her, that she will continue to do your will. Lord, we ask for a loving relationship with you. Bless our church, bless our communities, bless our households. Lord, we pray for the choirs they come to sing unto you. Bless their lives, Father God, that they will sing unto you, that it will not be a rehearsal but they will glorify your name. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us join together. Amen, Amen and God bless you. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. You are dismissed.